Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so today we have a new topic um, different from the Newton theory. Uh, we are going to start a new study area, the thermodynamics. Uh, thermal actually is um, uh, also a very important area in the physics study. Um, so, uh, so far we study how to use the new, uh, Newton theory to figure out uh, the acceleration and how to use acceleration to solve the displacement, velocity, and the time of the motion. And if the free body diagram is not easy to draw or the acceleration is not constant during the motion, then we develop a theory by using the energy and the work uh, to calculate the kinetic energy, potential energy, and use energy conservation to solve the speed. And we also study the collision problem. So we develop the momentum and angular momentum or other content to help us um, to solve uh, the speed before the collision, after the collision. So all of these problems are based on the, um, the motion or the Newton theory. And if we have not just one object, we have many objects or many body problem. For example, if we have a chamber and inside the chamber, there are millions or billions or trillions of molecules and different molecules had different speed. And we want to study um, the uh, relation of the temperature, volume, or the pressure inside the chamber. It's very hard to use Newton theory to do the study because for Newton theory, um, we have to do the free body diagram. And for each object, we have uh, one equation as a Newton theory F the net force equal to ma. This is just for one object. So if you have uh, millions of the objects, you have to solve the million of the equation. Um, that's very hard. Um, so we need to change the, the method uh, to study many body problem. So this is why we develop thermodynamics um, to study the equilibrium state when there are millions or trillions um, uh, molecular particles inside the chamber and how to use the uh, um, average pressure, temperature, or volume to get the work and how to get the, the total energy and how to get the heat absorbed by the chamber. So this is uh, uh, the objective for this topic. So before I move on, um, I have uh, a short introduction about the, um, the, the thermodynamics. The people study to uh, um, study the, the thermodynamics when they invented the heat engine. Heat engine is a machine and people use the heat energy um, to get the, the expansion of the volume and the expansion of the volume just drive the motion of the wheel. And if the wheel is spinning, then this machine can use to uh, load object or uh, drive a car or drive any machine to help uh, people to do job. And for each heat engine, I have a simple model here. And this simple model on the left side and could be separated into three elements. The first one is a heat source, the left part. As a heat source, we need to input energy. We can use fire to um, increase the temperature, or we can use electricity um, to increase the temperature of the chamber. Um, so by input the energy, um, the, ch the air inside the chamber will expand because if the temperature increase, the, the volume increase. So um, when the volume of the air expands, it will push the piston move forward and the piston contact with a uh, wheel, then this wheel is spinning. 
So the first one that's important is our energy input right here. Energy input. Energy input is to go in um, to heat the source, to heat the chamber. And inside the chamber, we need air. Sometimes we use the, the air, and sometimes we use uh, like nitrogen, or we use the oil vapor with uh, some oxygen. And the oil vapor and the oxygen, if they, they are ignited, then the chemical reaction will generate a lot of heat, like the engine in the car. And when this reaction occurs, the expansion is going to drive this uh, system move and, and the wheel will spin. And that's the air in the chamber. The third one is the piston. We need a very good piston and <clears throat> to make sure there's no leaking uh, during the expansion and the piston and the walls should be frictionless. Then uh, we don't uh, need to waste a lot of energy uh, to against the friction. So the three elements mm. are very important for a heat engine. And when we have a heat engine, we can use the engine to load the weight or to do the work. And a following question is, how do we know uh, how much work a heat engine will do for each circle? Since the heat engine is work circle by circle, if we know how much work uh, done by the heat engine for each circle, then we just need to use that value by the number of circles. Then this is how we calculate the work. So work is very important. And before we calculate the work, we need to figure out um, what kind of energy um, are there input into the chamber. Uh, let me stop the sharing. I'm going to use my whiteboard. Okay, so um, I'm going to uh, introduce the first law of thermodynamics. This, um, this law is also called the energy conservation. So, and during the, um, the work, each circle, we know this engine will absorb the heat from um, from the heat source. So the heat source inputs the, uh, the heat into the chamber, but the chamber will release some heat from the wall and or from, from the gap. So some heat will release. So some heat just release. So the net heat absorbed by the chamber will be equal to the net heat I use here, delta Q, um, is equal to the heat absorbed from the heat source plus the heat released um, by the chamber. And here I define the sign in front of the value. If the chamber absorbs the heat, the value is positive. If the chamber releases heat, the value is negative. So I use a, a plus um, between these two values. If we define all the value, it's positive. For example, if we define the release heat is also positive, then the net heat should be equal to absorbed heat minus the release heat. So here I use uh, a regular definition I define uh, the release heat is negative. So this formula should be uh, written into um, the absorptions plus re the release heat. So the release here. Okay, so the net heat equal to the absorption plus the release. And 
not all of the net heat will convert into the work. So if we calculate the work, if there is a piston and during the expansion, and if the temperature increase and the volume increase, the piston will move in and rightward. That means during the expansion, there is a force on the piston. So we use force. That's a force. This force is, um, is the only force exerted on the piston and uh, uh, help the piston moving. And this force um, is very hard to measure because it depends on the shape of the piston. This force um, might not be uniform if we just check a uh, different position. Um, but uh, how can we calculate the total force on the piston? We have another way. If we know the pressure inside the, the piston, if we know the pressure, and we know the cross-sectional area of the piston, let me write down, uh, draw a 3D, Three D piston. So this is a three D piston, and the chamber is also three D. Okay, in this case, you'll find that during this motion, mm, let's see, and if there is a force on the piston and we know the pressure inside the chamber, then uh, the total force will equal to the pressure times cross-sectional area of the piston. So if we know the cross-sectional area, this area. So um, if the piston move a distance from one position to another position, from A to B, So the piston from here to here, so we know the distance is delta D. Then the work done by the expansion is equal to the force on the piston times the distance. And the distance um, we know is delta D and the force equal to the pressure times the area or cross-sectional area. And we know area times the distance actually is the volume of the expansion. It's a volume, this volume. Volume. So we just need to use the pressure times the volume of the work. Okay, so in this case, we have a new formula to calculate the work and in the heat engine. So if the chamber expands and the work is equal to the pressure times the change of the volume. Okay, so just now we talk about the net heat. The net heat is delta Q. And then we talk about the work. And the net heat equal to absorption and plus the release. absorption plus release. And sometimes if the work, uh, if the, um, the engine is ideal engine and we hope the net heat um, is equal to the work, but when you do the measurement, you will find that this guy minus the work, the net heat minus the work is not equal to zero. So that means the engine absorbs some heat and not all of the heat um, converted into the uh, convert into the work. That means some of the energy just become a waste. So if we do the, the minus, the, 
heat minus work. And we got the positive value, then that means sum of the energy become the waste. So where does the waste go? Where does the waste go? Um, you can think about that. If the chamber, inside the chamber, there are millions of molecules, and if we put heat inside the chamber, um, the energy of these molecules will increase. For example, the energy of the molecule actually um, is the kinetic energy. For each molecule, each molecule, the energy could be equal to one half mass of the molecule times the velocity. And if the speed of the molecule increase, then the total energy uh, inside the chambers uh, as molecules um, will increase. So that means um, even this chamber absorbs the heat, um, it doesn't do any work. Um, the total energy will increase. The total energy actually is the total kinetic energy of the molecules. So we call the total energy of the molecules as internal energy. We use delta U to represent the internal energy. Internal energy you can think about as equal to the number of molecules times the kinetic energy of each molecule. But this very this is very hard to calculate. So we just need to uh, understand uh, the heat minus the work is not equal to zero because the molecule will gain energy. Okay, then we have this relation. We have this relation. The net heat minus the work is equal to the internal energy. This law, uh, this equation is called the first law of thermodynamics. Um, and you can interpret this equation as uh, energy conservation. The energy absorbed is the first term, and the output is the work. That's the second, the second term, and the difference is the energy gained by the molecules. Okay, so the next question is, how can we measure the heat? We want to we want to measure the heat, and the work is very easy to measure if we know the pressure and we know uh, the expansion volume. Then we know the work, and the internal energy is very hard to measure. So we want to measure the heat. The heat could be measured. Um, here, this is uh experiment, we can use different material and we uh, put some heat to this material and we measure the temperature and we can get a relation between the absorption, the heat absorbed as a function of the temperature. And here is the experiment. And let's take a look of the aluminum. If we have aluminum plate and we Heat the aluminum plate. Okay. Then we can measure how much heat absorbed by um, the plate. And we can also use a thermometer to uh, measure the temperature. And we find that if the heat um, absorbed by the plate increase, the temperature will increase and we get a linear line. The temperature is proportional to the absorbed heat. So the increase, the temperature is linear proportional to the heat. Okay, in this case, we can get a slope of the aluminum. And this slope is independent of the shape of the plate or the mass of the plate uh, or um, other things. It only depends on the um, this material. If we change the material, we use water, and we find that the slope change. Okay, 
If the slope change, that means the slope is an identity of this material. And we call this identity as heat capacity. So we use um, heat over the temperature defined as capacity, you know, heat capacity. And we find that the heat capacity has a relation with number of molecules. If uh, the material is large, then that means to increase one degree in the temperature, we need more heat. So uh, we want to divide by the number of particles. Let me divide by heat, the number of particles. Um, okay, if we use the heat, divide by the temperature, then divide by the number of particles, then we, key the, we call the heat capacity as a molecular heat capacity. And then we have other definition. If we measure the mass here, heat capacity, delta Q over delta T. If we divide by the number of particles, we get the molecular heat capacity. This is one, one method to uh, define the heat capacity. Another one is we don't divide by the number of particles, we divide by the mass. This mass. And we get another heat capacity and this heat capacity is called specific heat capacity. Or we call the mass heat capacity. Mass heat capacity. So this is a two different way to define the heat capacity. But I think the idea is the same. If we increase the heat, the temperature will increase and the slope is a constant. It only depends on the type of material. Okay, so let's measure how much heat absorbed by the, uh, by the material. And we have two ways to measure. The first one is if we have the chamber, okay, we have the chamber and the chamber has a fixed volume. And we put the chamber into a heat reservoir. This is a heat reservoir and it has a very high temperature. Mm -hmm. And inside the chamber, there's a low temperature. Okay. Then the heat will uh, transport from the high temperature to the low temperature. And we can measure how much heat absorbed by the chamber how much heat absorbed by the chamber and uh, the increase of the temperature. Then we can get uh, the heat capacity if we do the ratio. And in this case, because the volume is fixed, okay, so we call the heat capacity at the fixed volume as CV. Okay. C of V means when we do the measurement, the volume is fixed. This is the first measurement. The second measurement is if the volume is not fixed, we have a piston. <clears throat> okay, this is the piston. And we load some weight on the piston. And the weight is a constant. And we put this chamber into a heat reservoir. Reservoir. And this chamber absorbed heat and the volume expand. If the volume expand and we get, um, we can measure the heat, we can also measure the temperature. And we do the ratio, we get another heat capacity, Cp and Cv. And look at that. During the expansion, what's the constant 
inside the chamber. Because at the equilibrium state, the pressure on the piston is equal to the weight of the uh, of this uh, counterweight. Okay, so that means during the expansion, the pressure inside the chamber is a constant. because the pressure times the area of the piston equal to the weight okay, of the loading object. So we call the heat capacity and as C or P. P means the pressure is a constant. Then we have two types of the heat capacity. One is the heat capacity at constant um, volume, constant volume. The second one is at constant pressure. Then my question is, are they the same? Are they equivalent? Um, if they are not equivalent, which one is larger? CV and CP, are they equivalent? If they are not equivalent, which one is larger? Okay, to figure out this problem, we need to study the relation between the pressure and the volume. That's the equation of state. Okay? So I think you might know this relation from the chemistry class. So there are three laws um, from the experiment to build a relation between the pressure, volume, temperature, and the number of particles. And if we have uh, these three laws, we can write down the three law into one equation. That equation is called uh, equation of state. And let me give you a short introduce of the three laws. We want to figure out the relation between pressure, volume, number of molecules, and the temperature inside of the chamber. So to do this experiment, to find the first law, we want to get the relation between pressure and the volume. The simple experiment is we have a chamber and we have a piston. On the piston, we load a weight. And then we can change the weight on the piston and we measure the volume. And we find that if we increase the volume or we increase the weight, the weight give us a pressure. If we increase pressure, then the volume will decrease. And so far, it's very hard to get the uh, formula between the volume and the pressure. But if we do the inverse, inverse pressure and the volume, we get the linear line. So that means the V times the volume, uh, the volume times pressure is a constant. So that's the first relation we call Boyle's law. This law was discovered in 1662, very long ago. And the following law is the relation between the volume and the temperature. So the same thing, we have the chamber and the other piston. And we can use a thermometer to measure the temperature inside the chamber and also measure the volume. And then we find that if we increase the temperature, the volume will increase. So we have the heat reservoir here, and when the chamber gets hot, and then the temperature increase. And we need to assume there's no air leaking. There's no leaking during the motion. And the physicist find the volume and the temperature has a linear relation. That's the second equation, constant. The third one is of course Dalton's law. Dalton's law is a relation between the pressure and the molecules. Okay. So actually, uh, when they do experiments, they use <clears throat> the volume and the pressure. They find the volume and the, uh, a volume and the number of particles, the constant. For example, if we have the chamber and there's a piston. And um, 
we just inject some air into the, the chamber. When we inject the, uh, the air, the number of the molecule will increase. And we put some weight on the piston to keep the pressure as a constant, then the volume will increase if we inject the air. And the scientists find the number and the volume has a linear relation. Okay, so uh, eventually they get the pressure over the number of particles of constant. And we know the volume and the pressure has a relation. So eventually you get, if the volume is a constant, then the pressure and the number of particles uh, has a ratio, constant ratio. So from the three laws, and we get the relation between pressure, volume, number of particles, and the temperature. Um, we put the four parameters into an equation. This equation is called the equation of state. So P times V is a constant, and N pressure and the temperature has a proportional relationship with uh, volume. And here, to make this equation equivalent, we need to times a constant. This constant is called R constant of the equation state, and the value is 8.3, and the unit is joule per molar times Kelvin. And let's see. To um, I think this equation is not difficult, but I think the tricky point is to get the correct unit. So make sure the pressure you use is Pascal. Volume is meter cube. N is molar. And temperature is Kelvin. Okay, not Fahrenheit. Don't use Fahrenheit as the unit of the temperature. Okay. So that's the equation state. And let's go back to the question. CV and CP, the heat capacity, which one is larger? We already have the relation between the, uh, the, the volume and the pressure, the volume and the pressure. So I think we can get the relation between the CV and the CP. So here from the first law of the thermodynamics, we know the internal energy equal to the net heat. minus the work. Suppose, the first case, um, we have a fixed volume. If we have the fixed volume, and during the heat absorption, the chamber doesn't expand. The work equal to the pressure times the change of the volume. The volume is fixed, that means delta V is zero. So the work is zero. In this case, all of the absorption heat will convert into the internal energy. Okay. And the heat is equal to, the heat is equal to number of the molecules times the heat capacity at the fixed volume times the change of the temperature. So we get the formula of the internal energy. The internal energy equal to N CV delta T. So that means if the internal energy change, this guy change, the temperature will change. Or you can think about that. If the chamber uh, raise the temperature, then the internal energy increase. If the chamber's temperature decrease, then the internal energy decrease. Okay, we get the first relation, that's the internal energy as a function of the change temperature. Okay, second case, if we have a fixed of pressure, uh, constant pressure, The constant pressure give us some idea that um, the internal energy 
equal to the heat minus the work. Work is pressure times delta V. And then we also know the heat is equal to this guy, equal to number of the molecules times the heat capacity at the constant pressure times the change of the temperature. And uh, the internal energy we know, this is only depends on the temperature. So this is equal to number of molecules, heat capacity at the fixed volume times delta T. So we got the relation that's uh, N C V delta T equal to N C P delta T minus P delta V. From the equation of state we know P times V equal to N R T. In the constant pressure, pressure is a constant, okay? If, and we also know if there's no leaking, the number of molecules is a constant. But in the expansion, if the volume increase, the temperature will increase. So the P times delta V will equal to the number of particle times R times the change of the temperature. So this term could be replaced by N R delta T. Okay, so from this equation, we should know the number of particles canceled, the temperature increase change also um, canceled. We have the final relation, that's CV equal to CP minus R. This is relation, what we're looking for. You can find that the heat capacity at the constant pressure is always larger than the heat capacity at the fixed volume. And the difference is a constant, that's R. R equal to 8.3 joule per molar Kelvin. Okay, so this is uh, um, heat capacity I want to talk today. And let me give you some example, to help you understand what's going on here. There is a vacuum pump um, to um, extract the air inside the chamber. And consider a volume of the air and treat the air as ideal gas. So we can use the equation of state. At the pressure of nine times 10 to the negative 14 ATM, ATM is at the atmosphere pressure. One ATM is around one 10 to the five Pascal. And uh, this chamber is at ordinary temperature. That's 300 K. Okay. How many molecules are present in the volume? One centimeter cube. Okay. So to get the number of molecules, let's use the equation state. Okay. Pressure, we know five, uh, 10 to the five Pascal, but it says it's nine, 10 times negative 14 times 10 to the five Pascal. Let's use the standard international standard unit. How about the volume? Volume is one centimeter cube. One centimeter cube is 10 to the negative six meter cube. So we need to time 10 to the negative six meter cube. N equal to NRT, N is what we're looking for. And R is 8.3 and temperature 300 Kelvin. Okay. Then the N should be solved. Uh, the result is 3.6 times 10 to the negative 18 molar. Let me take a pause here. Do you have any question? Okay, let me move on. 
So we talk about the heat capacity. There are two types of heat capacity. One is molecular heat capacity, or we call it the molar heat capacity. And the second one is mass heat capacity, depends on which parameter we divide. So the first case we divide by the number of particles. The second one we divide by the mass. So you need to be careful when you do the uh, problems and let's pick out the units of the heat capacity, then you uh, are going to pick up which equation you're going to use. Okay, let's use a mass heat capacity to do the calculation. So there is a problem. It says there's a copper uh, chlorometer that can with mass 21 kilogram contains 0 0.16 kilogram of water and uh, 0 0.018 kilogram of, S, uh, of ice in the thermal equilibrium at atmospheric temperature pressure. Uh, hold on. So at the thermal equilibrium, so what's the temperature at that time? And we have water and ice coexistent. So that means if ice and water coexist, the temperature is zero degrees Celsius or 273 Kelvin. So this is a common knowledge you should know. And if we put a uh, 255 degrees Celsius lead dropped into the, the can, um, what's the final temperature? Assume that no heat is lost to the surroundings. Okay, so that means the lead will release heat. Okay, so the Q will release negative. And the water and ice absorb heat. And the Q is positive. And because the energy conserved, we have the released energy plus the absorbed energy is equal to zero. Okay, this is the equation we're going to use. Then let's calculate the heat release. We don't know what's the final temperature, so we just set that's equal to T. Okay. That's the final temperature. And the, the initial temperature of the lead is 255, so the change of the temperature will be 255 minus T. That's the change temperature of the lead. And the lead times the mass of the lead times heat capacity of the lead is the total heat released by the heat, uh, by the lead. Okay, so this is heat released. by the lead. Okay, that's the release energy. How about absorption? The absorption is equal to the water and the ice. And let's figure out, when the ice melt, um, the melting will um, absorb a lot of heat. And the heat absorption is equal to the, uh, the mass of the ice times the latent heat. The latent heat. Use L to represent the latent heat. And you can find the, the latent heat of the melting of the ice is, let me figure out what's that. If melting ice, latent heat is equal to three, 134 times 10 to the 5 joule per kilogram. This is for the ice. So that's 
So the ice is going to absorb the heat and turn it into the water. And then we will have all of the water. So the mass is the ice plus the mass of the water. That's the total mass times the change of the temperature. The change of temperature will be T. Uh, the final will be, uh, hold on, T minus zero. That's the change of the temperature. The change of temperature and uh, let's see, we have to multiply by the heat capacity of the water. So heat capacity of water, let me use C of water. Okay, that's the heat absorbed. And then we have the definition that the absorption is positive, but the release is negative. So we have to push this as a negative sign in front of the release. And we add this two terms. So we add them. Sum of the release and the absorption. That's equal to zero. So we have three terms. The first term, the first term plus second term plus the third term is equal to zero. And we can solve T, the final temperature. Okay, so do you have any question? Let me tell you the result. The temperature is 21.4 degrees Celsius.